Thank you. Hey, everyone. My name is Ariel Batris. I use any pronouns, and I'm a nurse practitioner here at Tufts University. I'm the sexual health specialist for this campus, and as of this coming summer, I'll have been working in college health for 10 years. Awesome. <laughs> but I'm tired. I'm tired of being angry. I need to be very clear, I'm not angry about the work. I love the work. My patients light up my life and have made me the nurse practitioner I am today. The anger comes from repeatedly meeting young people who have already experienced medically and clinically traumatizing situations, usually around their sexual and reproductive health needs. Previous experiences have led them to assume that when they come into clinical spaces, they will be dehumanized. I am so done with this in any clinical context, but specifically those around reproductive and sexual health, areas of medicine that are steeped in shame and fear. It's time to disrupt these systems. One way of changing clinical care in a patient-empowering way is by using a trauma-informed model. The trauma-informed framework recognizes that most people coming into a clinical care space may have already experienced trauma in their lives, and therefore, the clinical care should be approached carefully, where patient consent isn't assumed and where there is trust building. The first time I saw trauma-informed care in practice was a life-changing moment. My first job in healthcare was at a small clinic in Boston for disenfranchised youth called the Sydney Borum Junior Health Center. One of my roles at the Borum was to be a support person for people who were getting pelvic exams, which is an exam of the vulva and vagina. The medical director would come running into my office, put his hands on his hips, and go, pop girl, to the vagina cave. <laughs> the first time I helped in this role was a life-changing moment. I watched this cis male white doctor review the steps of the exam before he did them, check in with the patient throughout the entire process, and make sure that the patient had time between each step to be ready. I was floored to see such care. With my own history of medical trauma, I didn't know clinical care could be so safe. This job and this clinic, it was everything I wanted clinical care to be, and ultimately became the foundation for the kind of nurse practitioner I wanted to be. This was a number of years ago, and although the clinical guidelines around sexual and reproductive health have continued to evolve, general clinical care has not been reflective of that momentum. The change has been so slow because the systems of health in this country are built off of patriarchal, transphobic, racist, and capitalistic ideals. Changing systems that so deeply set and so big in our society take time. But it's time that we must be willing to spend. At its core, clinical care must be safe, patient-empowering, ethical, and evidence-based. My goal today is to help you learn how to protect your power in that space moving forward specifically around sexual and reproductive health needs. One way to advocate for yourself is by asking the provider to be explicitly clear when they are explaining a procedure. My first job as a nurse practitioner was in HIV prevention clinical research. And there was this one study that was looking at rectal-based HIV prevention modalities, and so, required a rectal exam for the participants. One day, I was finishing up a participant's exam, and I said, OK, it's time for the DRE. And the participant looked at me, and he said, what is that? And I said, oh, very casually. That stands for the digital rectal exam. And his eyes went wide, and he looked at me, and he put up his hand, universal sign of stop, and said, wait, what is that? And I really looked at him, and I saw that he was scared and confused. So I slowed down, and I said, I'm so sorry. I got lost in the jargon. The digital rectal exam is when I put a gloved, lubed finger in your butt to feel if there are any masses or prostate issues. He visibly relaxed, started to laugh, and said, Honey, I thought you were going to put your iPhone up my ass. <laughs> I love this story. <laughs> By the end of the visit, we were both laughing about the moment and clearly bonded for life over where my phone would never <laughs> be going. 
But in that moment, he had also made me a better provider. He had reminded me that my patients must always know what I'm talking about when I'm engaging with their bodies. It is also an example of a power dynamic changing in a clinical space. There are multiple ways to reinforce clarification from a provider and enhance empowerment in your own clinical experiences. Here are a few examples. Before we do this exam, I need to know what the steps of it will be. It is very helpful for me with this kind of exam to have the provider say what they are doing right before they do it. Are you able to do that? I will let you know if I need you to stop the exam. And if you want someone in the room, you can request a support person be present. Or if you're talking with a less than sex positive provider and they are sharing unsolicited opinions about your sexual history, you could say, it sounds like you have some opinions about STIs and sex. Are you able to put them aside and help me right now? Or if they are pushing procedures or testings that are not mandatory, you can say, my understanding of the guidelines is that it is not mandatory and not connected to the care I need right now. Now, let's talk about some important components of clinical settings and guidelines that you should be aware of. I want you to know what your options are. Let's start with a common screening test called the PAP. PAP smears are a screening test that checks cells from the cervix. The cervix is the opening to the uterus, and the uterus is at the end of the vaginal canal. By carefully and gently inserting a soft brush into the vaginal canal with the help of a carefully and also gently inserted speculum, we can collect cells from the cervix and assess them for precancerous changes. <laughs> yeah, science! There is a lot of confusion and concern about PAPs and pelvic exams, and this can prevent people from having full autonomy when selecting whether or not they want to have a PAP or a pelvic exam. They assume that it will hurt or that it will take a really long time. They worry that they can't stop it once it's started um, or that the brush is going inside the uterus. They've heard that you have to get them yearly and that you have to start at age 18 and that you have to get them if you want birth control and you can't get birth control without them. These beliefs and concerns are not misconceptions. They are based off of old, antiquated clinical guidelines and poor clinical practice. And in the absence of updated information and safe care, they understandably grow into fears. I can't stand up here and tell you how it will feel for you, but I can give you some information that I hope makes it very clear that pain and fear don't have to be baseline components of pelvic exams and PAPs. The current guidelines for screening PAPs is that they start at age 21 and then occur every three years after that. They are not recommended currently as an annual yearly test, and they haven't been a recommendation for a yearly test since 2012. However, the guidelines do change for folks as they get a little bit older or if there are abnormal results that need to be followed up on. PAPs and pelvic exams are not required for birth control, meaning a provider cannot deny you birth control if you want to have birth control and you do not want to have a PAP or a pelvic exam. I need to repeat this. PAPs and pelvic exams are not a prerequisite for birth control. Sure, if you're at your routine exam and you need a birth control refill and it's also time for your PAP, awesome sauce, go forth and PAP it up. <laughs> but my point is, on a yearly basis, Unless you have something going on that you need to have checked out, you don't necessarily need to have a pelvic exam. Providers don't need to just take a look. Pap smears are recommended for people who have certain genitalia, even if that genitalia is not engaging in heteronormative sexual behavior. What the heck does that mean? It means that sex can be defined by a number of different types of sexual and intimate contact. It means that a pelvic exam might be someone's first experience of anything medical near that part of their body. Therefore, the experience must be approached carefully with patient consent and only when the patient is ready and well informed. Pelvic exams and POPs without those factors can contribute to harmful health experiences. Another important area of health screening is STI testing because folks, hey, it's 2023 and sexual health, namely STI care, is an area of medicine that is still deeply steeped in shame, fear, misinformation, and stigma. I do see changes happening. I do. It's awesome. 
but the amount of times I am still hearing about damage done in other clinical contexts, people simply getting the wrong information about the diagnoses or being shamed by the provider they're seeing, not being able to get the testing that they want or simply being refused testing. Look, sexually transmitted infections, AKA STIs happen. They do. And if you are navigating a new diagnosis or an exposure concern or simply just when they get screening, there are some things I want you to keep in mind. Your worth as a human who engages in sex is not defined by your STI status. Testing needs to be linked to sexual history and sexual contact. Urine STI testing is a pretty common way for people to get testing. It's good at looking for certain STIs and is looking for what can be found in urine. So if you have only ever had oral sexual contact with people, i.e. your mouth and other people's genitals, and then you go and get urine STI testing, that's not necessarily going to give you the information you're looking for. Or another way to think about it, if you use it, test it. Oral, front genital, and rectal STI testing can all be done by self-collect swab, meaning you do it yourself. It's OK if that's not your jam. But if it is, you can ask for guidance on how to do it if it's not initially offered. Most STI tests, in the absence of symptoms, can give the most accurate results two weeks or later after sexual contact. So if I had a great sexy encounter two nights ago and I want to get testing today, that great sexy time may not show up on my testing today. Does that mean I shouldn't get testing today? Not necessarily. But it means I need to know what to expect from my results and plan for future testing. STI needs and sexual health needs are subjective and require nuanced and open conversations about things that can feel a little weird to talk about. Some of my patients come in every few weeks for testing, some every few months, some once a year, some longer. They know what their testing needs are because they trusted me enough to ask the necessary questions and I trust them to be the experts of their bodies. Everyone, every body, every sexual and gender identity deserves to feel safe and empowered in any clinical care context. This kind of care should not be revolutionary. It should be baseline. I would love to be able to say, seek out another provider, but sometimes that's not an option. We're working on it. There are other providers out there helping create new care baselines. But until then, I hope this information helps you safely and empowerfully navigate a currently corrupted system. By not engaging in clinical care based on patriarchal models, we can make them obsolete. These antiquated approaches need to be starved. I look forward to continuing to change the health systems with you. Onward. <laughs>